Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds, uh, the October wild bird update version of October. Uh, it's like like many months of the year. It's, it's, it's a very interesting month in the wild bird world. There's a lot going on, and we are uh, going to cover several topics tonight. And of course, we'll, we're always open to taking your questions and now, the Chiefs are playing tonight on Thursday Night Football, and they start in about 20 minutes. So if I get kind of antsy and I want to you know, speed things up at times, then uh, my, my apologies. I won't do that. We'll, we'll do our normal program, but just you know, the, the, just know that the Chiefs are on, and that's always important to us Kansas City people. So uh, welcome in. I get, we got people checking in already. That's great. Uh, they, I am Mark McKellar. I own a, a retail store, bird store in Kansas City, Missouri, known as Backyard Bird Center. And I've got a ticker going tonight across the bottom because people are continually ask how they can support us, me and Melanie, and and uh, how they can help uh, keep these programs coming. Because you know, I have to uh, obviously uh, pay the bills. Uh, and uh, these programs, you know, you guys subscribing and commenting and uh, sharing these videos it's is always wonderful I and mean, you get that helps and it helps with the, get me more attention which of course helps out with the YouTube and all but other people you ask all about how we can support us and we do have an online store and it has grown since uh, we started these YouTube videos which is wonderful we got a lot of you guys are supporting us and we absolutely thank you for that so that's what the ticker is about going down there I normally don't do that but uh, I've had so many questions. I thought I'd put that up there so people can can check in. Now, let me get going here on see who all is joining us tonight. Uh, Sandy Dion has a couple of questions we're going to talk about. Hey, we'll get to those. Hi, Sandy. Uh, and of course, I, I didn't mention right off the bat, you know, whenever because we're here in the middle of the country and, and uh, we always ask you to let us know where you're checking in from. That helps us when we're uh, answering questions, especially regionally this time of year. So we're going to talk a lot about regional variation in October. Uh, so please let us know where you're checking in from. So, and let's see here is, let's get started on this. Christina Seminillo, I guess. How do you pronounce that? Thank you. Uh, and Dave from Rhode Island. We missed you last week, David. That's, thank you. Oh, right. He was, I, I got you. <laughs> Family, boy, they can keep you spread pretty thin. And uh, David, I don't know, you know, you're one of my big proponents. And I, we've talked about uh, a video going viral. Well, we, we, it kind of happened for us. We had uh, last Monday night, we had a, a, a video about keeping uh, bird seed, not keeping bird seed inside, keeping bird seed is at 229,000 views right now. So we are super excited. So, um, I, and, and I really appreciate your support. And you've been very supportive of the channel since we got going. Oh, let's see. Can't wait for another great show. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and another other grill regulars, Steve from South Alabama. Melanie is in the other room, but she's she's kind of yelling at me from there. Right? Get the instructions. So, oh, my gosh. We have a couple of quail. Oh, my. You've got quail living in, uh, under your Talk about a bird that is disappearing and a bird that's near and dear to my heart, Bob White, sir. I was in charge of Bob White quail on Fort Bragg when I worked there right out of college. And so it's a bird that I've studied and and really, really love. And I hate to see the demise. They have really diminished in numbers all across their range. Okay, Ruth Music from Lacine, Kansas. Yep, you're close by here. Let's see. Oh, yes. <laughs> I love when you guys communicate with each other. That's great. You know, greetings from Maine. Hi, Jen G. All right. Yeah, I bet you up there in your part of the world, that's been a tough transition, and I'm sure in September especially. And we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. Let's say, oh, welcome. And for the, from Kansas City. And nice to have you in. Right, Naj, it's great to see you. All right. Let's see. Unit 10 is from Central Georgia. How is the famous Mark? Well, I don't know how famous that is, but yeah, you know what? I it's I, the 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 channel is growing and the popularity. And I was at a trade show the last few days, a, a buyer show for our the, our store. And uh, I, I go to the show every year, and I see a lot of people that I recognize from all around the country come to that show. And and I talked to a lot of people, and there were people who were recognizing that the channel is growing and congratulating me on it. So that is wonderful. 
All right. Raj. That's what that's it. That's exactly. I know you're you're local in Kansas City. So hi, Denise, my West Coast regular for sure. Uh, uh, Washington State. Welcome in. Lafayette, Indiana. Larry, good to meet you. Home of Purdue University. We have a, a, a I guess he's kind of a cousin. And my, my, my wife's side who went to Purdue. Loves that place. He Big Purdue supporter. Sandy, Dion, you, you had the questions up front. and Exactly. Well, it showed we we're, we're going to get to those questions. Yeah, right. I'm going to go back up to those questions once we get into it. I want to give people a chance to get on. Um, uh, so I don't try to discuss things too quickly because it takes a while, especially for Facebook people. Is there, there's a bit of a delay when I start these chats, uh, these programs. So I kind of, these first few minutes, I like to do the, the greetings and things because uh, I don't want to get into a topic uh, real quickly that uh, I don't want people to miss out on. But I'm going to go back to your question, Sandy. Yeah, I, I'll, I will get those up there. Um, but eat the willow tree. Hello from West Virginia. Thank you for the compliment. Yeah, West Virginia, beautiful state. Uh, we drive through there on the way home to North Carolina quite a bit. All right, let's see. Oh, I got you. I understand now. That was that, that you a question that. So you two are. Uh, ah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Jolie. Good evening from Pennsylvania. Just received our new feeder from you. Excellent. And Mark Snow is very all right. Excellent to know. I was talking to several people from Pennsylvania this weekend at the trade show. There was one guy who has a a garden shop, but bird store a lot in the bird seed emphasis in the east, kind of in eastern Pennsylvania. And um, boy, he we were sharing ideas. I say, you know, it's I love meeting people from all over and see what they're doing in their stores. Hey, Mary Lou from New Jersey. Raj, bluebirds were at our feeders today munching on some nuts. That's great. They love the little small pieces of nuts. The peanut hearts are a real favorite of theirs. And yeah, that's the, you know what? Uh, we're going to talk about bluebirds, the shift going on in bluebirds right now, where we see that, uh, the, you know, they're. The northern birds, when we're going to talk about that bad weather up there, what and some of the birds that gets pushed down, and bluebirds come down in, in good numbers in some years. Uh, and so we're starting to see that happen already. Oh, unit 10, okay, this question just appeared. And her question was about using oats um, and, uh, and bird seed. Is it good for birds or not good for birds? And I, I, it's not, oats are not super uh, nutritionally valuable to birds. Uh, but they're not bad for them. So if you, if some people mix them in with their suet and things like that. Uh, it's, it's okay to do that. Just know that they don't, they don't have a high nutritional value for birds. So uh, if you could uh, if you use something that's a little more nutritional value for them, like nuts at, 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 with the suet it might be a little bit better, but there's nothing wrong with using those like that. So Carrie cites Wadlow from Kansas City. Yeah, we just spent the last <laughs> two and a half days together at the trade show. Carrie's my store manager at Backyard Brood Center. And yeah, she was at the trade show too, exactly. All right. A couple more. Peggy sends Casey from Atlanta. Absolutely. Welcome in. My brother spent many years in Atlanta. Alabama, Birdie 81. Welcome in. Hi, Susan from uh, Illinois. I, is that, are you the one that's from Kankakee? Is that, or somebody, I know one of our watchers is from Kankakee. Ricky Flair, bird watching is underrated. <laughs> Thank you so much. And that is, you know, uh, we get asked to discuss a lot about our, the age demographics in our store and things like that. And, um, and yes, if the bird watching hobby has, it, it's always had a, an older demographic. It, but we are seeing younger people getting involved, and it's great to see that in our store and and all these chats and things that uh, people uh, more people getting actively involved in bird watching. It is a fantastic hobby. All right, David, thank you for yep. Here's his reminder. Uh, thank you so much. Hit the like buttons, and and uh, I, I, it, it does help. And he's right, David. It did. It, it helps the. Uh, we would YouTube and my placement and my exposure. I don't know what happened with that viral video. It, to me, I know my son tells me that it's not viral, that it had, takes a million views to be viral. But in the bird 
feeding world and the bird information world, 229,000 is viral in my opinion. Um, but I don't know if, if it was, uh, you know, we got a real great placement from YouTube or Google or somebody, but we popped up somewhere and it really boosted it. So it was great. All right. Oh, okay. That, that question was older. Okay, Sandy. Yeah. Okay. That, that, an older question about the, the oats. Uh, dried mealworms, big discussion about mealworms this weekend. It, 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 and uh, suppliers, um, yeah, the bluebirds absolutely love them. We are still searching for a new supplier of uh, dried mealworms that are raised in America. A lot of the dried mealworms come from China. And we are scouring uh, for, a, we had a grower here in Missouri that it, it since you know, went out of business a month or two ago. And so we're looking for a U.S. The raised and dried uh, mealworms right now. Thank you, John. Great channel. Thanks for the advice on the feeders. On to so many birds, from chickadees, or warblers, or cardinals. Excellent. Absolutely, we love it. And there is another uh, close by person. Hi, Kurt. Thank you so much for. Uh, Kurt sends us lots of great pictures, and he has a bluebird uh, fanatic like a lot of you are. He raised four successful broods out of the, his box this year. And, and, and he is, you know, in a fairly urban area here in uh, Kansas city. So absolutely. There's Kankakee, Illinois. There you go. It's it, it, Sandy from there. Okay. Excellent. Bonnie from Nebraska. You're watching the cheese rock again. I know it. Uh, believe me, I'm going to, I'm going to watch as soon as we get off. I, I say, go, Oh yeah, this has been a rough year for, for uh, Denver. So, but, I think, you know, anything, any night on any given day in the NFL. So I'm not super, super confident. Excellent. A, a steel monkey it, it picked up a, a, a peanut wreath. Absolutely. Well, thank God. I like think now we've got a chance for kind of people to get in and I think check in with everybody. Um, one of the things about October, October is uh, the huge uh, fall transition month. And you guys to the north, and I, you, you know, I, we've got lots of followers up there. And I was talking to some uh, people from Canada at the show this weekend. And, you know, the winter sets in pretty darn quick up there. And you're, uh, you know, it, it, one of the things that we do, we get excited about uh, if you're bird people, we love, we love the change. We want to attract as many different kind of birds to our bird feeders as we can. And we look forward to seeing different birds. Uh, at different times of the year. And uh, when it gets to the cold weather, you know, there's no uh, more famous sign or uh, indicator uh, of uh, the, the winter is coming, of course, uh, than the uh, the junco. I mean, the junco is uh, the snowbird, as, as people call them, and they are the symbol of winter for a lot of us. Now, uh, you know, they, they don't nest this far south. The, the closest nesting juncos we have to our area is like the um, the Black Hills of South Dakota, nesting population there. And then there's nesting populations out in the mountains of Colorado and things. But for us, they're in the eastern U.S. It is truly a winter invader. We, we see them come in and they're like clockwork and we love them. And uh, they are sparrows and people... You know, question that when I uh, when I do my native sparrows program, and that which uh, is quite popular. We're going to talk about that, and I'll put a link up uh, to my sparrows video in the in the comments later. But juncos are sparrows, uh, and they have to abandon their northern haunts. They nest all the way up to the edge of the Arctic Circle, and that that gets covered with snow really quick. And if you're you're a seed eater and you can't get to the ground, you have to move south. So that's that's true of a lot of our native sparrows. Um, and the, the junco uh, is one of those, but also um, like the white-throated sparrow uh, is one that we look forward to uh, coming in here in the winter this far south. Um, they, in some years, they don't get pushed as, as far south very quickly. So we, we wait and we wait and we wait. And they don't show up and sometimes until you know December or January. But um, the, usually in the fall, we get a lot of sparrows moving in and we look forward to them in our feeders. I'm a big sparrow lover. I, I wrote an article that got published for the Conservation Department here in Missouri years ago um, that did very, very well. And they reprinted it as a brochure, uh, the Winter Sparrows of Missouri. Um, unfortunately, it's out of print now, um, but uh, they I, I still do a 
I regularly do winter, I do sparrow programs for uh, master naturalist groups, Audubon societies, garden clubs, things like that, people who want to learn to identify sparrows. Um, so that is uh, an example of one of the big transition birds here in, uh, that are coming in right now. I, I know we've had white throaters reported locally. We had our first juncos this past weekend being on. So you guys up to the north, I'm sure you guys have, uh, have been seeing juncos already, but you know, the further south you go, they're coming. They're on their way down. So let's see what we got checking in here. I have... You've heard of seeing a bird of prey feeder with net me. Um, I it, it, bird of prey feeders. Well, all bird feeders are bird, bird of prey feeders, uh, especially coopers and sharp shin hawks and northern goshawk. I heard now this American goshawk now, not not northern goshawk here. Um, but it, it, I read an article many, many years ago called Feeding Birds with Birds. And so that's naturally uh, a, a, a not intentionally, but you know, you, bird, birds of prey have to eat too. But there are um, some places where they do do uh, bird of prey feeding, where they put out carrion. And, uh, and, and, and you know, turkey vultures are the most famous. Eagles eat carrion a lot. Most of our hawks don't eat a lot of carrion. Um, they're they, they you much rather catch live prey and eat it. Um, but I know uh, I mean, when I was in Europe, there are feeding stations for uh, red kites uh, set up where they put out a dead carcass and, and the kites come in and feed on the meat. Whenever they put out a dead carcass uh, in winter, especially up north in Minnesota and places like that, I've been where they'll, they'll put a deer carcass out um, as a feeding station. And they the, even small songbirds, chickadees will come and eat and pick on the fat of these uh, animals, uh, the dead animals and things. So uh, that I have heard of it. It's not really advised because you're going to attack uh, raccoons and a lot of things to it, but um, it is it, it is done. Absolutely. All right. I had a couple a day, of days ago. That had what, a bluebird a couple days ago. I'm sorry. I'm getting behind on my, my messages, Kurt. So um, I don't know what that is. Okay. Um I had a scarlet tanager Monday and Tuesday, but it's gone today. That is great. I, I love scarlet tanagers. Absolutely beautiful birds. And then, yeah, they're still migrating. Migration is still happening. We have, you know, our um, our birds, a lot of our uh, warblers and tanagers and areas, you know, they're pretty much pushing through and pushed through now. Uh, and here, well, usually the things that linger are things like yellow rump warblers and myrtle warblers. Well, uh, the migrants will, will and then, and, and of course, um, uh, ruby crank kingless, things like that. Those will stick around for a little while. But what we're doing is seeing the birds that are going to move in like these. Uh, uh, yellow belly sapsuckers are moving in. Um, uh, brown creepers are moving in for the winter, things like that. that we, a lot of those don't come to feeders very much. Sapsuckers do, especially peanut feeders. All right. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they, they get this, the snow starts to cover up and here come the juncos and they have to have open ground to feed. You guys had a lot. Okay. Shenandoah National Park already in down there. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we don't see, we see juncos toward the end of September some years, uh, and, but it, usually they're out in the field. They don't come to feeders. They don't get pushed into feeders until a little bit later, maybe even November before we really regularly see juncos coming to feeders. Um, they're just going to eat the wild seed they can when they first get here because we don't have any snow or frost yet. So maybe the case there. Seeing a white throat in New Jersey. Good, good. Oh, a junco, Kurt. Okay, that's what you said. All right. Yep, you guys had a had a junco sighting. Well, yeah, I haven't. I haven't been home to see my juncos. They may be out there. Um, yep, yeah, Mary Lou. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen the boreal chickadees feeding on the carcass in Minnesota before. Um, up there, yep, that they will do it. And people think it's morbid and they don't understand it. But when you're putting out a suet cake. You're putting out beef fat. You're putting out what he's eating on in that carcass. So uh, it's it's basically the nutritional substitute for insects for a lot of birds in the winter months, and that's why that is appealing to them. But there's a lot of birds that will eat on a carcass. I would like to know more about turkey vultures. Germany. Boy, it is in there. We saw tons of turkey vultures today driving back. Uh, we drove about two and a half, two, three hours um, from east to west across uh, I-70 here. Uh, and boy, there are a lot of turkey vultures moving. So yeah, yeah, they it, turkey vultures are fascinating in that they nest in 
uh, you know, old abandoned buildings or structures, old barn structures, things like that, uh, in pretty remote areas. They 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 don't you know, it can be urban areas, but they they don't like a lot of activity, um, and they all they're moving out. If you guys down in Texas uh, can vouch for me, uh, or in Florida, the Gulf Coast states. <laughs> the you you go by a, a cell phone tower or a radio tower down in that area during the winter, and it is just covered in turkey and black vultures. I mean, they are on every rung, and it's pretty amazing. And then they start heading back up here in March. So yeah, they're passing through now and won't be back for uh, for a few months. That's yeah. Kurt's got a great um, uh, pond he built in his backyard, a herp pond as we call them. Uh, mainly for you know the frogs and things, but the the what the, the birds it draws, and I'm going to talk about water like I always do. And they've had uh, yellow rums uh, drinking. It's very dry here right now in Kansas City. It's uh, we we need water, we need rain. So he's going to do well with that little pond. Do you think metal perches on the two feeder can get? No, I do not. Um, this is a question that's been asked for years and years and years. The fear that a um, a bird a metal perches on a bird feeder. Uh, there's always a fear that a bird's feet could get frozen to uh, the metal feet. I've, I've been doing this for 40 years, and I have never witnessed it. I have never had a report of it. I have heard people say they've heard of it, but I've never had anybody actually have it. Um, and then part of it is, you know, bird's feet are, co are covered in scales, and scales repel water. And so you know, even if they were to come straight from the bird bath, and fly over and land on a metal perch, the water has pretty much gone off the feet by the time they get there. Uh, and they don't freeze. And it's, I know some bird feeder, like Aspect is my favorite bird feeder company, and they put rubber um, uh, perch covers on their metal perches. And part of that main reason for that is to keep the perch from sliding in and out, in and out through the tube. Um, but another thing is to give people confidence because there are still a lot of people who believe that a you know, bird can freeze to the feeder. Um, but really it, 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 it is not. It is not. Um, it's a fascinating topic of uh, how how a, a bird can stand in freezing water, anyways, uh, like geese and swans and things like that. Uh, their feet can be in in ice cold water, and they can do that. Well, it has to do with the capillaries uh, and then their in their legs. The blood vessels are so close together that the warm blood from the heart warms up the cold blood that's coming up from their feet. And it keeps the bird from dying of shock because of that cold, really, really ice cold blood was pumped into their heart. It could really uh, uh, harm them, but um, their bodies are adapted to that. So you don't have to worry about that. That is uh, that is one I've heard for many, many years, and I'm glad you asked that. Absolute pretty one. I tell you, those little ponds are great. Uh, you know, Ruth, who works for me, has a fountain, four-tier fountain, five-tier fountain that she's had running for years, and her backyard list is amazing from the birds that visit that fountain. All right. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, it, it, this, this, you know, and I, I, I have programs, you know, you've seen my, you may have seen my videos. I have what I call the September slowdown. Um, it anymore... We actually have decent bird activity almost all the way through September now, but now it's the October time that is the month that is really dead for us at bird feeders. I'm, and I get, I still have bird activity a little bit, but like you said, they, they, and it's Mother Nature. Mother Nature is kicking our rear ends right now. She is they, all the berries, all the uh, the seed heads, the grass seed heads, the acorns that are falling all of the natural food that's out there and they're taking advantage of that. And you can't blame them. They've got to do that. Uh, and we get a lot of that going on right now. And, and uh, this is a, a picture I was going to add in to, to kind of illustrate that. Um, the, see, this, this is the best month for cedar waxwings in our area because of all the natural fruit that is ripening for them. And they're gobbling it up. They absolutely uh, eat huge quantities of, of uh, natural berries and they have very inefficient digestive tracts, and so they're they're pooping out the the uh, uh, partially digested really these berries, and so it helps with the germination, and so they spread plants uh, all over the place because of their, their how they eat, and and because they are very inefficient digesters, but they're gorgeous birds. And you usually hardly don't you hardly ever just see one. Um, usually, when you see sag cedar wax wings, it's like this. Uh, you, they, they travel in flocks, um, and they, they and bird baths are great because they they're not seed eaters. 
So getting them to come to your brood feeder can be tricky. Uh, sometimes they'll they'll discover fruit if you've got fruit in your mix, but not uh, not often. The, the way to get them are like bluebirds and, and uh, several of the mockingbirds, Carolina wrens. A lot of those birds, water is the key to attracting them. So you, not only do you get the seed eating birds, but water helps you get things like cedar waxwings here. A picture that Mary took. So I see a couple of juncos, white throat sparrows, brown creepers, and still. Yeah, this is the, the, the great point, Sandy. This is this is that week or two that you can get juncos and hummingbirds in your yard at the same time. They get that overlap. Uh, you know, the, the hummingbirds on their way out, and the juncos are on their way in, and you get that. This is that time, and you can see both of them in your yard, which is always fun. All right, Daryl. All right, so we got the we got the grandson joining in regarding roosting boxes. Would you put the whole at the bottom or the top of the box, it it well if you it, it, both will work, Daryl. They um, you know if you just want to leave up a reg the, the nest box as is, um, you know, they will use it. The birds will go down and and into the bottom of the box and they'll stack on top of each other. You'll have a there's some really famous pictures of uh, you know like 15 bluebirds in a bluebird box all stacked on top of each other roosting uh, in the winter. But a lot of people who specially design roosting boxes. Um, they they take they take the door in the winter months. They'll take the door off their bluebird box and flip it upside down, and then put it back on. So the birds enter in from the bottom, and then in the top they'll put a little perch up in there, a couple perches if they want the birds to, to set up on there. But I tell you, uh, a regular bluebird box works great for roosting. And and chickadees will stack in there. You'll see pic you know, there's pictures on the internet of you know. 20 chickadees crammed in a box, uh, just sleeping on top of each other. And of course that helps them with warm. So it's a good question. Very slow of the feeders. Yep, yep, absolutely. And I, I don't know if you watched my video a couple weeks ago or, or about, you know, when you're dealing with those slow conditions, put less seed in your feeders this time of year because your, your, your chances of having moisture problems and having to throw out seed because you never leave seed in a feeder longer than a month. So you're not throwing away nearly, or you're giving it to the raccoons and the possums when you toss it into the woods. But yeah, it's really a good idea, you know, to, to not put so much seed in your feeders this time when it's so slow. But it'll pick up, and then we'll we'll start getting our the calls and people really worry that they've done something wrong to drive their birds off. But it's not; it's just nature. It's their, you know, I always equate it to having to eat French fries every day, every day all your life versus the the buffet line. And right now, Mother Nature is offered up the buffet line for them. And that's, they're just taking advantage of that. All right, Daryl, from the, I placed the entrance hole at the bottom to preserve heat, but would it potentially get too hot? Not, I, I don't think too hot would ever be a problem, but what, the, the, when you put the hole at the bottom, Daryl, um, is their, their ability to get up uh, away from that hole because the, wall, the, the hole is gonna let air in, cold air in, um, and, and to do that, you would need perches up top for the birds to perch on up there, while in a, a standard bluebird box, they would uh, get down the holes up at the top, um, and they, they'll get at the bottom and, and, and to conserve their heat down at the bottom of it. And they can all stack on top of each other, which they'll do. It's not a problem for them to do that. All right. Ali from St. Montreal, welcome in. I'm, hey, no problem. We understand. Absolutely. Yeah, Sandy, that's a good point. Uh, here, you know, when it comes to air, the question I answer a whole lot is, when should I take my hummingbird feeder down? Well, my answer has always been, as long as you're willing to keep it fresh and keep it clean, and of course, the cooler weather, you don't have to change it as often. If you keep your hummingbird feeders up later into the season and you're maintaining it, your chances of helping a straggler coming through are pretty high, which is good because, they, you know, when they're coming through, the flowers are died back uh, and there's less food for them out there. Uh, so having a hummingbird feeder up, and I think I have people who now in our area, they tend to keep them up almost until Thanksgiving because they, you know, there's stragglers coming through. But right now we get, we've got several hummingbird reports in the area this late, and this is a good month later than we used to ever see them. So near Hawk Mountain, Pennsylvania, wonderful place. Uh, would a deer we let your our yard as natural as possible attract for absolutely and they, and, they, and you know if you watch me regularly you know I, I promote native landscaping and and the importance of that and we had a, a native plant nursery at my nature center there in Pittsburgh uh, years ago and one of the first ones I knew about that 
And it was great to, to uh, try to encourage people to, to plant natives and maintain natives. My wrens do an excellent job of eating bugs, but it's all around. Absolutely. Wrens are the best. They, 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 they find bugs in the cracks and crevices and, and they're amazing. Well, we talked a little bit about the, the, the native sparrows that are coming in and the juncos. Well, another big thing that we look forward to every year is the winter finches that come in. And this is when we're starting to see them. No. And, and it is amazing how many questions I get about this bird right here. Um, I have so many people who say, you know, I, they call me and say, what is this new bird I have at my bird feeder? And it is just a winter goldfinch, an American goldfinch in her winter plumage. And they they look so dull and compared to those bright canary yellow males in the spring, people, you know, don't realize that they're goldfinches and they're get a lot more goldfinches in our area in the winter than we have nesting here. Uh, and, you know, the Dakota birds and the Southern Canada birds, whenever it freezes up there, here they come. And usually December is when I see the goldfinches really move into my backyard here. And they'll be here through April. You know, about April is when they tend to go back up north for the nesting and, they, and where they should be. But the goldfinches are, you know, of course, the prime finch. But we look forward every year to all the different finches that come in. And this year, I understand from the people who do the, um, the finch forecast, winter forecast every year, that this is, should be a really big year for pine siskins. And pine siskins look like striped goldfinches. They are the same size, they have the same bill, the same body shape, everything, and they'll be feeding with them, but they just are striped. And you can see the yellow in the wings and the yellow in the tail. So be on the lookout. You know, uh, I remember years ago, a friend of mine who had just gotten started, and uh, <laughs> he said, well, where, how do I... Uh, where do I need to go to see a, a pine siskin? I said, go home and look at your feeders. He said, what? I said, it's a huge winter. It was years, years ago, and they were go, the, the siskins were moving in uh, like crazy. And he called me about an hour later, and he said, I came home, and there was a pine siskin on my bird feeder. How did you know that? I said, it's, it, when we have them, we have them. They, you know, they come in in big numbers and they're feeding with the goldfinches. Um, some years we don't have any pine siskins. We hardly see any in certain years. It depends on the food crop in the north. That there, if, even with snow, a lot of their food sources, as long as there's there, there's a lot of it, then they, they stay up north and they'll spend the whole winter there. This seems to be a year they're going to invade, so be on the lookout for those. All right, let's see. Whoop, sorry, didn't mean to hit do that. Hit the wrong button. Uh, well, I got my purple martin house as a hub. Should I close the openings in the winter? Absolutely. Um, stop the because you will have sparrows uh, roosting in them and getting a hold of them. And so, no, close up all your Martin households for the winter. And then in the spring, you know, we go through that whole program of just opening one when you hear them and, and then to gradually open them because the sparrows will start to take over. No doubt about it. Yeah, definitely close up your Martin houses. This is... What is your opinion on leaving your brood feeders up when a sick bird is noticed? I saw some opinions on leaving them up because they would be sick elsewhere. I, I, I just believe in cleaning uh, uh, your bird feeders and make sure you use a 10% bleach solution um, when you see a sick bird, but, and especially the conjunctivitis eye disease and house finches. Um, take your feeders down, give them a good thorough washing. Usually those birds don't live very long. You just don't want them spreading it uh, to each other. It's just, it, it, it's just something that house finches are, are, are weak to. And um, that's a, I just believe in, now some people, you'll see it published. Some people recommend taking your bird feeders down for, you know, two weeks. Uh, and, but I, I, don't, I just keep an eye on it. And if the, if the sick birds are coming, make sure you clean them. And if you want to take them down for a, a little bit and to try to make them move on and you're right, it, they're, they're going to try to feed because when they're in a sick condition like that, they are not good at finding their own food and bird feeders are uh, an attraction to them because there's other birds eating and they can follow them around. They can't see very well. So just make sure you clean them uh, uh, very well whenever you, if you see a sick bird. Oh my goodness. Um, I, see, oh, India, I, I can tell you that sunflower, safflower, peanuts, that's the easy answer. Uh, feed seeds not grains. Uh, so black old sunflower, single best seed you can feed. 
make sure you feed plenty of that. Uh, if you want to go hullless with sunflower hearts and medium sunflower chips, those kind of things are wonderful. Safflower, a uh, you know, big favorite of cardinals and, and uh, house finches and several birds. And then peanuts are really high energy food for a lot of birds. So I would definitely recommend those for sure. I do from uh, Northern Illinois. Gee, good. Welcome in. Jamillions. I am a middle area of Georgia. I had two pair of rose rustic rose beaks in the spring. Yep. So you back in the past week. Uh, they're moving back through. Okay. Well, they, yeah, I think they do. You're, you've got birds that nest up uh, north of you and uh, they, their gross beaks are, I passed through. We had some on bird hike here a couple of weeks ago um, that were, they, you know, we have them that a few that nest in the, in the Kansas City region, but most of them nest to the north, up to what, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and that area is where I'm most familiar with them nesting. And uh, But they do come back through in the fall. Yeah. And, and it, it, there are a lot of young birds and they look like the females. So we see more of those than we do see the, the beautiful males in the fall. All right. Eight pine siskins Tuesday and Wednesday this week. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, they're, they're, it's going to be a big winner for Pine Siskins. They're going to be coming in in good numbers. No doubt. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on when you started feeding and when you really start noticing, but every few years we get a good invasion of them. They come down and uh, I think it's been two or three years since we've had a decent uh, showing of them here in the Kansas City region. All right. Let's see. Birdie, you're going to have an Eastern Phoebe. Well, no, I love Eastern Phoebes. Yep. Great fly catching bird, very entertaining. Oh my gosh, Jelly, even gross beaks. That's such a. <laughs> yeah, we just never see evening gross beaks anymore. That's a bird that has declined, but also they don't come far as far south as they used to in most years. They they visit feeders across the northern tier. You guys in Michigan and like say Wisconsin and, and, and Minnesota, northern tier states, you guys still get evening gross beaks up there, but boy, we just don't see them as far south. The soot log feeder, I bought one myself, although I noticed no birds try it. Instead, an acorn. <laughs> that was funny. They, I tell you, you got to give them time. That's for sure. When conditions get harsh, that's when suet picks up. And once they discover it and start using it, they believe me, they will. I think an acorn woodpecker, uh, they are funny birds. I think they, uh, and yes, they store, uh, they don't store the peanuts like they do the acorns they find. Northern Nebraska, some people seem to have blue jays in the winter. I don't. I put out peanuts. You know what what blue jays do? Um, it, it, they're very oak dependent, and so they tend to move around and search out areas of high acorn crops. So what likely happens in your area is there's not enough uh, natural uh, nuts to, to – uh, sustain a, a good population and uh, keep them happy all winter. So they probably, they may not move very far from your area, but they'll move into areas uh, and nomadically to move into an area that has a good crop, acorn crop. So if your tree, if your oak trees didn't produce a lot of acorns in your area, boy, they'll have to go maybe a hundred miles or a thousand miles, depending on the blue jays will can travel great distances to find a, a decent acorn crops probably what's happening there. I'm right, from Jan's Art in Belton, Missouri. Very close. Yep. Orange County, New York. How many suitcakes do I put out during the winter for 50 birds? Oh, I wish I knew that that number. Um, it really depends. Um, and, and it depends on what kind of activity. I have I have people, uh, you know, our truckload sale will be coming up in November, and I have people who buy cases of suet for the winter months. I have some people that only go through three suitcakes in a winter. It's Super variable. Very, very hard to answer that question. Absolutely. Uh, took my birds a long time to get used to the log feeder. Now they love it. That's right. And that's, that's uh, you know, I do a video as one of my earliest videos I ever did was that new feeder syndrome. How long does it take for a bird to, to get used to a feeder or start feeding on a feeder? Birds are scared of feeders when you put them up new. Uh, they have to be leery to survive. And so, they will ignore a feeder for quite a while to make sure it's not going to eat them. Um, and then, of course, usually chickadees are the bravest, and they jump in there and they start eating. And um, the, uh, the then other birds will come in and they'll start using. Next thing you know, they're just using it like crazy. That's what we typically see. Absolutely. We know that not just songbirds uh, moving into the area. This is, of course, is um, 
well, the time of year that the Raptors are on the move and uh, sharp shin hawks. For us here in Kansas City, we don't have a lot of nesting sharp shin hawks in Missouri, actually kind of quite rare as a nester. But um, in the winter, the sharp shin hawks, the, uh, the, the accipiters, the bird-eating hawks I talked about earlier, uh, the long tail, and uh, this is a nice adult sharpie who's uh, hunting on the bird feeder station. Lo and behold, and that's what they do. Um, they they hunt all over, but bird feeder stations are like the lions at the waterhole in the Serengeti. They they gather the waterhole because they know that the antelope and everything else, wildebeest, all that are going to come there to drink water. Well, hawks learn that you know bird feeder stations are a bevy of activity, and they're going to pick off one every once in a while, but. I'd much rather have a hawk catch a, a, a bird like that because it's natural than I would a cat, um, you know, that is not a natural predator. And birds don't know to be uh, super uh, weary of them. But the hawks zip through there. So be on the lookout for the sharp shins. Look at that that nice gray helmet on this bird versus um, the Cooper's hawks, which are much bigger. They tend to have a cap and not a helmet on them. This is a big adult female Cooper's hawk, and she is consume the bird. Um, but they're, like I said, they're going to catch um, the birds and they're going to eat them. And that's what they do. That's their role in nature. So, uh, you know, I, I know it, and it, it tugs on the heartstrings and people, oh, I hate it when they catch, a, you know, one of my cardinals and things like that. There are a lot more cardinals in the world than there are Cooper's hawks, that's for sure. So, yeah, they just know this is coming and it's, it's, it's part of feeding birds. Let me see where I left off here. Julian, you have a huge red oak tree. Dad was a science biology teacher. I always said, most beneficial tree. I concur. But uh, absolutely, Joe, you are absolutely right. There's a, a very famous uh, a book about landscaping with native plants. And uh, he's a professor at the University of Delaware. And he has a, a there's a quote in there that uh, he's counted over a hundred species, I think, of, of, of caterpillar slash. Uh, uh, moth slash uh, caterpillars and on one oak tree as he surveyed this whole big oak tree and he, he was able to document 100 different caterpillars and stuff. So, and that's all bird food. Um, very, very important. Uh, uh, oak trees are one of the most important plants uh, uh, for birds all, all on the planet. Frontier, start to see the winter birds here and so Southern California. The white crown sparrows, you get a lot of white crowns out there. You definitely do. And the yellow rumps. And your yellow rump warblers are known as Audubon's warblers, where the ones out here are known as myrtle warblers. And one day those are going to get split back out again, but they lump them together and call them both yellow rumps now. Absolutely. I recently in Unit 10 seen a wild bird grit feeder on a bank. <laughs> oh, with a small bag. Yeah. I, yes. I, I, I've never actually marketed or seen any, a, a feeder itself because sand is readily available for almost all birds, you know, small pieces of gravel. And yes, they need grit in their crawl or their gizzard to help them to grind up the seeds and, and, and everything they eat. Um, it is part of it, but it's not a huge component and it's not a, I mean, they don't need a lot of it and they'll pick it up and they can pick it up just about anywhere um, so I don't know that I would invest in a feeder specifically for that. I know some people put to make sure just just know there's sand and dirt nearby and you'll see them land there and they'll pick up some pieces and they'll, they'll fly off. So, yeah. Love seeing hawks. Oh God, that's exactly right. I, I love birds of prey and that Cooper's hawk is an incredible animal. Absolutely. Just got started last winter in my yard by a, a hunting red tail hawk <laughs> startled. Yep. Flew across the yard right in front of me. Red tails are big, impressive birds, and they are not really a, a threat to other birds. Uh, these, they, you know, they're mammal hunters. There's a big, nice picture of a red tail. Um, they uh, said, so, well, they'll eat chickens. Well, chickens don't act like birds. I'm sorry. Chickens act more like mammals. And yes, red tails will, will take a chicken. But um, for the most part, they're, you know, they're, they're eating your squirrels and your rats and your rabbits and your mice. Uh, things like that. So very, very important parts. We get a, our our really big hawk season for this part of the state of Missouri is is November. That's when they really start rolling in from the north, uh, and they're getting pushed down again. If their world's covered in snow, uh, they can't catch mice and, and 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 mammals effectively. Then they have to move south, and we send them move gradually south all through the winter. And we get a lot of them. Our, our all on the power poles and power lines along the interstates. Would just be loaded with red tails, and especially mid to late November, it's pretty deal to be all over. 
All right. Let's see. Mary Lou Mawson got startled. I got you. I've got that one already. Sorry. Wanted to know if oatmeal is okay. When I saw his question, I wondered, I put dry quick oats in my homemade peanut butter suet. It, there, there's nothing wrong with them, uh, Sandy, they, they, with, with oats. Uh, they're just not very nutritionally valuable to birds. So um, like I said, I, I, I don't ever use oats in my bird seed mixes or those are grains that, um, you know, again, most of our birds are seed eaters. And, and that's what I like to cater to. If you're going to put uh, in, in your homemade suet mixes, I like putting in peanuts and peanut pieces, peanut hearts, peanut butter. Um, and, and because it's the beef fat they're really, really after. Uh, I don't like putting bird seed in my, uh, my suet mixes. Um, a lot of the, that suet just passes right through the birds because it's coated in that grease and it's not as it easily digestible. So it takes up space for the more important things like uh, nuts and the beef fat that, that they're really looking for. But oats are no, it won't harm them at all. And so um, if you want to use it, it's, it's fine. It's just not the most highly nutritional. So. Cooper's talking about back here for three days. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, the Cooper socks are definitely bird uh, bird eaters, and they will uh, come through. The good thing is they miss more than they catch, but they're going to catch a bird now and again. This they and they are capable of catching squirrels, but mostly they would be more like chipmunks and smaller mammals like that. Uh, they'll they'll catch those. All right, let's see. Yep, the hummingbirds are on the way out, man. Just moving through. I was once holding a house bear for reasons and had a shark shit hawk attack me. Oh my goodness, they, that, that had to be frightening. Um, you're right. Uh, they That's like, uh, you know, catching a fish and reeling it in and a snapping turtle just snatches the fish right off your, your line and stuff. Yeah, I was out in my front yard in the spring one year and there was a robin. I heard it chattering and going crazy. And he came barreling just low to the ground right beside me and flew under my pickup truck. And right behind me was a Cooper's hawk and came right. And then this Cooper's hawk saw me real quick and then turned and fluttered and, and went on. But that Robin was like, he was looking for a place to hide. They are, they are definitely predators. Gone awry. Welcome from Northwest Arkansas. Beautiful, beautiful country down there. <laughs> what is the best bird pet that doesn't cost farming? Well, uh, okay. Uh, two different questions. The bird setting up a bird bath closer to cover is good. You got to give birds you know, confidence. So having water close to cover really helps them with you know feeling confident to go get in a bird bath and be able to fly into a place. So I like having bird baths near cover unless you've got house cats and then you want to get it further away from the cover because house cats use it to pounce. Now I've done. If you want to, if you go to my well the YouTube channel and you search my playlist. I have a playlist called Mark's Favorites and uh, uh, Mark's Favorite Bird Bath is one of my categories that, that I talk about. And I absolutely love that feature. It is more expensive than, than you know, we have lesser uh, models uh, and ones that don't cost quite as much. But as far as the total features, I absolutely love that cozy spa, the bird, the, the um, it's a scallop bird bath, we call it. And uh, it keeps the whole, it never freezes over. It's, Got a hump built in the middle for different depths of water. It's the best bird bath. But like I said, it's not cheap. It's uh, uh, Electronics have gone up and thermostats and everything else. So heated bird baths are not as cheap as they once were. So I agree. I make my own soap blocks. No junk in it. Now my birds are spoiled. <laughs> Don't, yeah, I absolutely, I agree. People who make their own suit are very dedicated to it, Joey. That's for sure. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It, they, uh, it, there are a lot of fun projects out there um, for, uh, you know, home bird feeding and things like that. And uh, I, 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 I'm going to end with water because I, if you watch me on a regular basis and you say, oh, God, he's going to get on water again. I understand that. But unfrozen, a source of reliable unfrozen water is the most important thing you can do for birds. This is a beautiful uh, winter Harris sparrow, which is the mascot bird for our local Audubon chapter, but you can see the snow on the rim and unfrozen water. Absolutely. For so many birds, I showed the picture earlier of the cedar wax wings, um, uh, uh, Northern mockingbirds, Carolina wrens, and they love these birds that are not, they're mainly Southern birds that are not as well adapted to winter. Uh, finding a heated bird bath is huge for their survival. 
because they're they're just not adapted to these winters here and they're not as good at seeking out uh, water sources. And so we see a survivorship in urban areas where people do have uh, unfrozen water for bird bass. And whereas some on you know, some refuges will see no uh, Carolina wrens survive the winter uh, in some winters, whereas in urban areas they do. A lot of that has to do with unfrozen water. So be ready to get your heated bird bass out. You guys in the north, I know you guys are already getting freezing temperatures and, and seeing some snow. And uh, I know it's going to uh, in this area, we're supposed to get down oh, high 30s and maybe the 40s there in the next couple nights. And, and so it's going to get start getting colder and colder. So be ready to plug those uh, bird bath heaters that, or a heated bird bass in. All right. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for joining in. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I thank you guys for your support and joining in. It is an honor to be able to, to talk with you guys uh, every couple of weeks. If you buy soot, what is the best kind of soot to buy? Okay. My opinion on soot cakes is what I've just talked about. And, and uh, we sell uh, Pine Tree Farms and CNS, which are both good quality companies that make good soot cakes, but they have just there are people who won't spend more than whatever on a suet cake, so they they have to make suet cakes that are full of bird seed, and they are and they're I, I people buy them I don't like them, but if some uh, I like peanut cake the peanut treat uh, woodpecker treat are two of my favorite suet cakes from CNS uh, nutty butter is uh, my favorite uh, formula from Pine Tree Farms, and they don't have a lot of they they don't have seed in them they have peanuts tree nuts and suet fat, beef fat. And those are my favorites. Um, and they, and I'll put a link to that in, in the, the description below in, uh, for later. And it'll be linked to my online store and you can buy them there or you can look at them online. You know, just, uh, just don't, you know, when you turn over, okay, and I've had a video on quality suet. If you look, turn your suet cake over and you see a bunch of millet and sunflower seeds and, and uh, Milo and stuff like that, put that cake back on the shelf. You find one that has just nuts in it and read the ingredients. It rendered beef fat, peanuts, tree nuts, those are better for your birds for sure. All right. <laughs> ah, David, I appreciate that. Oh, yeah, hit those likes. Absolutely, it helps. And uh, if you can share, share. You have an electric data froster, yes, and and no, and, and, and I can't believe any of me asked. There's still there's no mm -hmm. solar bird bath deicer that that it, out available that really works efficiently. You have to have electricity, absolutely. Thanks a lot, absolutely, Daryl. Thank you, and, and good luck with your your roosting pockets for sure. Right? Hopefully, you get some activity this winter in them. Those chickadees are coming back; they will. Georgia again, I usually feed sunflower and safflower seeds, but what is best to draw in the goldfinches? I, I personally, my, my personal goldfinch mixture I sell the most of is a mixture of Niger and fine sunflower chips. We call it black tie. Uh, I like more sunflower chips than Niger, but I like the, the mixture because it gives good nutritional value. Some people are opposed to feeding Niger because it's not mm -hmm. grown in this country. So it's if you feed just straight fine sunflower chips, that's great. It, they're higher in oil, higher in fat than Niger, mm -hmm. and better for the birds. So that is definitely a, a, um, a good way to go. So good question. All right, Melanie ch chiming in there. Oh, and Ruth, <laughs> go cheese, absolutely. Again, thank you, everybody. I'm gonna go uh, try to take in the. The rest of the Chiefs game, and I uh, hope we win. Go to go Chiefs! Thanks again for all your support, and we'll be on in a couple of weeks. And watch for new videos to be posted between now and then. You guys are great. Thank you so much.